one of the component parts, you immediately affect the aggregate sound of what it is that you're actually going for. If you spend any time reading reviews or, um, let's say, interviews of guitar heroes, whether it be um, Richie Blackmore or the old Hendrix um, interviews, Pat Metheny, uh, Jeff Beck, there's always this section at the end of the interview where um, the magazine is asking them, well, you know, what, what belongs now to your gear? What's, what's, what's the latest device that you've um, come across? What amplification are you <coughs> using both in the studio and, and for the live show? And you'll see that these um, colleagues, <laughs> I can, guess I can call them colleagues, um, suddenly they become very animated and they talk very passionately about their gear. And see, we're all a little bit, um, it's kind of like a drug. Um, the minute you start buying pedals, um, you don't stop buying pedals. And um, it becomes this kind of obsession because everybody's looking for, quote, their sound. And if you think about um, the vernacular styles right now, and you think about your favorite guitarists, you realize that part of their signature is not only um, A, their technique, B, um, their phrasing, and C, obviously the style um, to which they're contributing, but a lot of their imprimatur has to do with their sound. And, and that has to do with element one, element two, and element three. Now, let's talk about element one for a minute. Um, I showed you a picture of um, the early Gibson ES-150. Uh, that was a hollow body guitar with a pickup. We have to um, think about this in terms of um, a few important let's say, parameters. First of all, there are electric guitars with 24 frets and electric guitars with 22 frets. 24 frets means that the entire octave from E to E is covered. I'm assuming you all know um, the basic tuning of, of the guitar. Um, it's very important, though, to note that, for instance, a, um, a Gibson Les Paul only has 22 frets and the Stratocaster only has 22 frets. But an instrument like this, or the Parkers, the Ibanez instruments, they have 24 frets. So immediately, one of the first questions they ask is, well, what's the range? And I say, it often depends on actually what instrument a person has in their collection. So um, that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two has to do with the bridge. Um, this is a... Um, a whammy bar and um, affords me the possibility. Uh, you are going to switch out of. Nope. So I should have sound. anyway what I need to show. The whammy bar allows us to rise and descend in pitch. Now I can get similar response by <laughs> so one, one more time the uh, whammy bar itself um, gives us a hands-on opportunity to change the pitch. Um, we have the so-called dive bomb thing, where we go all the way down, and we can raise the pitch a certain small interval. Now, we can simulate the glissando upwards by a string. 
extreme bed, of course we can't go down. Set. Um, yes, sorry. Um, I don't need to repeat that, right? Um, so it's extremely important to find out, does your guitarist have a whammy bar and this possibility to affect pitch change with this hand? Or does he have um, a bridge which is fixed? Now, for instance, some of you probably know um, that Fender and even Hendrix played both Telecaster and Stratocaster. Well, the Telecaster has a fixed bridge, and the Stratocaster has the whammy bar. So it's often a kind of um, temporal and stylistic decision which is being made. So that's key. And another um, key aspect about the guitar, and you're going to find this quite odd, um, is that on this instrument, for instance, this, oh, I only have a volume knob, which now needs some work, um, and, and it gives me certain control here. Now, you probably know from various photographs and videos that guitars are often stocked with various knobs here. Most of them are tone control knobs. They can do very lovely equalizing on board the instrument. Now, I have actually, I don't want to get into this issue yet, I have a pedal here which is a seven band um, equalizer um, to affect similar changes in tone. Now, um, to go further a little bit with the uh, physical characteristics and the components, what we have here are switches which um, determine the configuration of the pickups. So I can get actually a rather broad variety of sound by just Treble and bass 
knob, at least one knob filtering both. Um, then the pickups. Very important, some guitars like the Stratocaster only have single coil. And models such as the Les Paul have humbucker. Now there's a little story in that the single coils tend to be extremely um, vibrant and very, very delicate, and they feed back quite often. So the introduction of the hum, humbucker was to sort of try to get that um, under control. And so there's much less feedback danger with a humbucker pickup. Now, of course, one can use feedback to one's advantage, so it's nice, actually, depending on the contents, to have those very sort of alive and hyperactive um, pickups engaged. Uh, what else? Um, well, okay, I spoke about the double, the dual output. That's very special. There's another aspect too here. The guitarists talk about solid body versus semi-acoustic. Um, and that is you'll have um, a thin body, though it's hollowed out. And then you have the classic arch top. Um, which is more um, designed for jazz music in, in particular. So it's, it's key to find out, well, what type of instrument does your guitarist have, or instruments do they have in their collection? Um, these two are subject, obviously, to certain dangers also having to do with feedback. Um, at certain volume, they, they really start to take on a life of their own. Um, so one has to be very, very um, careful. But if you're somebody that's writing a piece where, for instance, Louis Andreessen wrote this um, quartet called Hout for saxophone, electric guitar, piano, and marimba, and it really comes out of the sort of bebop tradition, then one of these two guitars is clearly um, the choice, I think. Um, in terms of um, sort of replicating a kind of aesthetic and, and style that he was going for. Okay, now I could go on a little bit about this because as you probably know, um, there are hundreds of models of electric guitars on the market right now. The key is to understand that um, the companies are going for their own sort of sound and their own character, and that a lot of these instruments vary ra very radically in their, in their tone qualities, in their timbre qualities, in their flexibility. And so it's very, very important if you're gonna be working with a guitarist to um, become familiar with his or her sound particularly with regard to what sort of instrument he's or she is using. Now, I'm going to talk um, briefly about the second and third components of this um, triangle here. Um, many of us spend a lot of time uh, working on processing. And I ostensibly think about this in terms of either an analog world or a digital world. Um, the analog world features, features various stock pedals such as these. Well, this is by Boss. They have some 50 type um, pedals in their catalog. This is a kind of boutique maker barber. This is a compression. So, um, you will see on stage um, that people have these rather um, complex pedal boards designed, and they have, a, 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 you know, concomitantly a complex signal chain. Um, and this signal chain ostensibly deals with some of these issues that I have up here. Um, let's see, we have this. Yes, I have a. Um, chart of sorts which 
lays out the kind of um, the kind of processing that most of us get into. Now, some of you that have had experience in the electronic studio will know um, quite a bit about um, this, and some of you that are new to the um, the area of um, processing will see um, some of these terms and, and really not be able to make an immediate association. So what we would like to do is basically categorize um, things, amplitude-based effects, time delay effects, waveform distortion effects, as well as other miscellaneous effects, filter for frequency response effects, and common um, combinations. And one can work in either the analog or digital domain and create combinations or chains of some of these um, effects. Now, if you work in the digital domain, you have the opportunity to do MIDI control. Um, you have the opportunity to do very fast patch changing and you can control things to, um, for instance, if we're talking about delays or any sort of fine tuning, you know, up to milliseconds um, with the press of a button. If you're working in the analog domain, well, more or less we have a setting here. I mean, I have a volume blend and sustain setting. It's very hard during performance to alter that. So you kind of have, you have these chains set up. Sometimes you have um, rooting and rerootings. You have an A and B path which you can choose from. So you can have, let's say, four pedals designated, designated to the A path, four pedals to the B path. So there are ways to get around these quick patch changes. So I, my experience, and Richard Barrett's piece is a good example of that, is that if you have very, very, very complicated processing going on, um, that is, um, people that are really calling for very, very minute changes and very detailed um, crafting of the sound, to go with the digital um, domain is, is probably the safer. And if you're um, dealing with pieces which perhaps just have one or two general sounds, then I prefer Personally, and this is all very, very um, subjective, um, what I'm talking about now, um, I prefer the analog world because I think it's uh, infinitely um, warmer and um, it has a, the sound for me has a more, let's say, physical um, character to it. It's, it's more personal in a way. So, if we though move from analog to digital, even by keeping the electric guitar and the amplification the same, we're still coloring the sound in a very, very particular and special way. So um, one has to be very, very cautious there. And if we have a hundred different distortion um, or overdrive pedals on the market, and you say activate your distortion, well, a boss distortion is going to sound much different than an Ibanez distortion, which is going to sound much different than a Marshall distortion. So it's very key here to find out what is my guitarist using um, in terms of how are they producing their, their overdrive or distortion sound. Now, the last area here, which of course is key, is amplification. And um, here we can think about things in three general categories. Either we're thinking of tube amps, we're thinking of transistor amps, or we're thinking of modeling amps. Now, I hate the last category. They've made incredible um, leaps in the past decade or so, and just with a click of a button, you can move from a Marshall stack to a kind of California sound, to um, you know, uh, a New York downtown brunch, and you just can keep clicking through, and you can sound um, like 50 different guitarists. Um, it's sort of interesting at the beginning, I suppose, and there's a little bit of a thrill involved, but at the end, um, there's something 
for me, anyway, is missing in the sound there. Um, and it has to do with a kind of life. Now, um, traditionally, uh, the great heroes were using tube amps, and, and the lovely thing about the electric guitar um, sound is that when you have lovely tubes um, that are really super warm and slightly overdriven, you have a kind of classical uh, electric guitar sound which is basically unbeatable. Um, and when you push this beyond the point um, of no return, you start to get very, very interesting um, uh, crunch feedback. And so the tube amp for me also personally is the sound that I prefer. The transistor amps um, for a while were used in um, certain jazz uh, musics and um, country and western. And some of them sound okay. Of course, there's no danger of the overdrive happening. And um, it's a very personal take on things. They make less noise, per se. Um, you often get ambient noise with the, the tube amps. It's just sort of life, um, life in the grunge, as it were. So, to go back, then, just step away from this, um, we could have a Les Paul on one side, um, a Stratocaster on another, this guitar on another, and we have three, three different sounds. We add uh, an analog chain to this and a tube amp, and we have one kind of ambient and character. If we throw this into the digital world and use modeling amps, then we have a completely different character. What I'm trying to say is that um, if you hear recordings now of uh, new art music, any, any um, colleague um, that's been asked to play electric guitar in an ensemble piece or chamber music piece or even solo pieces, you really um, hear a very, very different character from performance to performance. I don't think that, for instance, if you took um, Lachemann's um, piece for, uh, let's say, um, solo cello piece, um, Pression, of course you hear interpretive dis differences, but you don't get such a radical difference in timbre and, cl and, and clang. Um, that you would in this, in this domain, and that's the big danger. I've had situations where I've met up with composers, they've written pieces, chamber pieces or ensemble pieces, and they've come to me and said, yeah, but in my studio it sounded like this, and I said, well, you know, here's what I have. Um, we have to wrestle with that right now and, and come to terms with these capabilities. So you have situations where the composers work out an entire array of timbre and texture and then basically build their pieces around, um, around um, this experience only to be hugely disappointed when they give over the score to an interpreter who has his or her predilections, whether it has to do with the guitars they own, the pedals and effects um, that they use, or their um, choice of amplification. It's critical that early contact is made. Um, and it's also critical that one has a lot of patience.